bonsoir, bonsoir à toutes et tous. Je crois qu'on attend encore peut-être quelques-uns de vos camarades, mais on ne va pas faire non plus trop attendre notre, notre invité, qui nous fait l'honneur de, de sa présence ce soir. C'est vraiment un plaisir et un privilège de recevoir Monsieur le consul Crawford, donc le consul des États-Unis à Lyon, dont une présentation un peu plus, un peu plus précise va être faite par mon, mon collègue Louis Daniel Mukachibende. Um, so, uh, Mr. Consul, um, as I just said, and you properly and perfectly understand Fra French, but nonetheless, uh, just to Uh, be polite <laughs> and welcome you uh, in English as well. Let me repeat that uh, we are very pleased uh, and honored to have you with us to, tonight. Uh, so the students uh, here are um, mainly in the um, bachelor's program and they study additionally to the, uh, to the bachelor some specific uh, topics and uh, some of them or most of them uh, study world foreign policy. So, Uh, in your position, I think that you are um, a perfect guest. Uh, uh, guest, sorry, to uh, tell them more about the U.S. Um, perspective on uh, certain topics and matters, uh, and the constitutional order of the of the uh, USA, and some probably uh, insights that uh, uh, sometimes are not fully visible for us from the from the outside. So, uh, Louis Daniel, you, you might say a few additional words, uh, but on behalf of the, the law school uh, of uh, Lyon Catholic University, thank you very much for being with us tonight, and, uh, and um, the floor will soon be yours. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Michel. Um, as my dean say, uh, the floor will, will very soon be Uh, Mr. Council's floor, but just a couple of minutes to introduce him to you. Um, first of all, I'm very happy as we have this, uh, let's say, first conference of the academic year, and we have the pleasure to host someone who is not only, um, let's say, uh, someone working for the diplomacy, I mean, dealing with international matters, but there is also a kind of brotherhood, let's say, between him and has, because as I probably noticed uh, within his uh, biography, Mr. Crawford is a lawyer holding a JD uh, degree in law from uh, William and Mary College of Law. He also has uh, a very rich experience in uh, international affairs. Um, I would say in two main um, domains, civil and also military military because uh, Mr. Crawford um, had to work for the U.S. Army in Iraq uh, particularly and also within a U.S. Air Force base in Virginia, if I don't make a mistake. And within the diplomacy, uh, narrowly speaking, um, he held uh, several positions in Sydney, Australia, in uh, Delhi, Oriental Timor, Uh, if I don't make a mistake, in Paris as well. And you also worked for an NGO at, in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Yeah. So he knows what he will have to discuss about. And especially this afternoon, he will deliver um, a speech on uh, focusing on the US Constitution. As you know, maybe tomorrow it will be the, let's say, 134th anniversary of the U.S. Constitution, and it was adopted on September 17th, 1887. 17. 17, yeah, 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 thank you, thank you very much. And we can, I can also say that this Constitution is one of the most, let's say, um, famous and important that you will have to learn in comparative constitutional law. It has been, um, sometimes criticized and challenged. Let's think of the civil war, um, fight for equality, um, civil rights movement, and so on, but it is still there. 
like I can say a kind of umbrella under which the nation in America is protected and is prospering. So when it comes to discuss about the way the power is shared within the United States, this is what he will have to discuss about now. And I don't want to uh, spoil you know, your pleasure to listen to his speech. I will then immediately give him the floor. Mr. Council, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Je suis très heureux d'être ici aujourd'hui. Et j'ai entendu dire que tout le monde parle anglais parfaitement. Donc, je vais changer à parler en anglais, spécialement dans les choses de la Constitution et le droit, parce que pour moi, ça c'est mille fois plus simple. Mais aussi, tout le monde parle anglais. Donc, c'est parfait. Um, perfect. So today, we're going to talk about the U.S. Constitution and kind of the U.S. government and where it gets its power, how the power is divided, and a little bit about the Bill of Rights, kind of going over each of the Bill of Rights. So, and, I, and I'm going to ask questions. If you, the way in the U.S., so as, the, as, as they said, I'm, I went to law school in the U.S., and in law school in the U.S., the way the teachers actually teach is they ask the questions and the students teach. But th with that, you have to read a lot before and other stuff. But I'm going to ask questions, and, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion. If there are questions during, please feel free to ask, uh, and we can talk a little bit about it. But before the Constitution, and basically with sovereignty, is the, the power of the government was held by one body. So before here in France, the king had the power. In England, it was originally the king, but then after the Magna Carta, it was shared with the lords. And it was within that idea that this sovereign has the power to make laws, to enact laws, and everybody else has to follow them. And it's, it was always centralized within, within that, that country. So after the US fought for, the, for our independence against Great Britain. We had 13 states, and they're called states because they were essentially 13 countries. So they formed what's called the Articles of Confederation. So the, during this time, they all got together to work together, but none of the states wanted to give up their powers. They wanted to keep everything. For me, the Articles of Confederation are similar to kind of the European Union. They are these countries, these states that still have their power, but they're, they have a shared common goal. Now, the big difference is the European Union was made up of a bunch of countries that were very strong and founded and had their armies, their international relations, everything set, whereas the 13 states were brand new countries and had lots of different issues and problems. So because of it, with it there was no strong centralized government there was no agreement uh, between the 13 states that after a certain amount of time, it fell. And they knew they had to come up with an idea. So the problem was, is that you had no centralized government, but at the same time, this, these 13 states didn't want to give up their power. So what was the solution that we came up with? You guys know what we call the solution? So, yes. Federalism, exactly. So federalism, that's perfectly it. It's where all of the states have their own sovereignty, have their own power, and there are levels of government. So we also call that spheres of power. So that each of the states have their own power, but then they, have their, they also have local government has their own power, and the federal government has their own power. Some of the power is different, as we'll talk about later, but some of it overlaps. So for example, taxes is one that I can talk about. Is in the US, we all pay federal taxes. So you work, you pay your federal tax, but then you also pay your state tax. So every state has different taxes, and so you pay different state taxes. 
and then some places you pay local taxes. So if you live in Los Angeles, you're going to pay taxes to Los Angeles, you're going to pay taxes to California, and you're going to pay taxes to the United States of America. So sometimes when it's hard to compare when we compare taxes in France to taxes in the US because it's very different state by state, but it's also different even in each location. So for example, in Texas, they don't pay taxes on, on uh, income. So you don't get any income tax in Texas. And in Nevada, they pay very little taxes, uh, the citizens overall. And why do you think Nevada pays very little taxes? One of the what? The smallest states? That's one of, the, that could be, but there's, there's what, what's, what's Nevada famous for? Because incomes are through casinos. So the, the casinos make a lot of money, and it's, it's our state with, that's almost the entire state has gambling in it. They make a lot of money, and they tax the casinos heavily. So because of it, they don't tax the citizens as much. Now, Nevada is a, a desert, and it's one, one of the reasons that it's that way. Another one is Alaska. Alaska, the, the oil companies actually pay citizens. You get $5,000 a month to live in Alaska, or 5000 a year, not a month. A month would be great. But, <laughs> but you get 5000 a year to live in Alaska, and it's paid by the oil company to Alaskan citizens. Um, so these are just some things that are a little different. Um, so the Constitution, within our Constitution, this is one thing I did not know, is that the U.S. government does not have the power to do whatever the U.S. government wants to do. So oftentimes we will see the president wants to do something, wants to make a change, and the president cannot unless they have the power to, or, and Congress cannot. There are three types of power that are within our Constitution and within our federal government. Those are the ones that are, we have expressed powers, they're, they're ones that are, are completely written in the Constitution saying you have this power. There are reserved powers and there are concurrent powers. So we're going to go over each of those categories. So uh, delegated powers are powers given to the Constitution, given to the federal government in the Constitution. So for example, the Constitution says that the federal government can coin money. So it is the only government that can coin money. The state of, of Nevada can't coin their own money. The state of any other state can't coin their own money. Regulate interstate and foreign trade. So Utah, my home state, cannot make a peace agreement or a trade agreement with France. It, that is 100% done with the, well, and with the federal government. Raise and maintain armed forces. Declared war, of course govern the other territories and also emits new states. So right now there's, there's talk of Puerto Rico becoming a state and there's even talk of Washington DC becoming a state, but it is up to the federal government if they are allowed to and up to Congress. And that is a power that's in the constitution. And then yeah, the last ones conduct foreign relations. So these powers are completely written in the constitution. There's sections, there's articles that tell you that the government has these powers to do these things. The next one are the implied powers. So the implied powers, and this in law, we often call the necessary and proper clause. So within the Constitution, it says that the US government can do anything that is necessary and proper to achieve those other powers. So you have, you have the power to raise an army but they don't technically have a power to make a Navy or an Air Force. That's not in the Constitution. Well, it's necessary and proper to raise an army to have a division between the Navy and the, the Air Force. That's a, a power that's implied in the Constitution. So uh, you can coin money. It doesn't say you know, what kind or how it's done. It's kind of implied and, and proper that, that they decide, here's what we're going to do with this. Um, so some of the examples are kind of like interstate highways. The federal government pays for and funds interstate highways. Because if you're traveling between Utah and California and Nevada, you're gonna cross over three states. 
Who's going to pay and maintain those states? It's the federal government, because that is commerce between the states, even though the roads might fall within each of the states. Uh, another one is time zones. So within one of the, one of the uh, powers that is, is in the Constitution is the government can regulate the standards of weights and measurements. So it's our federal government that's still at fault that we don't have the metric system. So if you guys want to blame somebody, it's still our federal government. It's not the states. The, the, the federal government can do, can do that. But it's also the same with time zones. So the, they are the ones who kind of decide who fits in what time zone. So some of the stuff you can't, um, sorry, I'm just going to make sure I'm going to talk about a few cases. So there are some times that, that Congress will try to pass laws and say, oh, well, it's necessary and proper for something. So there, in the 90s, we have a law that's Violence Against Women Act. So it's a good law. It's trying to end domestic violence against women. You see it's still a problem any, everywhere in the world. One section of that law said that if a woman was attacked, she could sue her attacker in federal court. Now, there's nowhere in the Constitution that says anything about domestic violence or violence against women. There's nowhere that says that. So Congress said, well, this is commerce, because if a woman's been attacked, then she doesn't buy as much and won't contribute as much to society. And our Supreme Court came in and struck that part of the law down. They upheld most of the Violence Against Women Act, but they said you can't sue somebody in, in federal court because of this. Now, in all 50 of the states, you can sue in state court, but you can't in federal court. So there are certain things like that that Congress will oftentimes try to tie into the saying it's necessary and proper, but unless they can, they're not allowed to make a law about it. Uh, another one was, was a gun-free zone, saying you can't have guns in a certain distance around schools. And the Supreme Court shot that one down, saying, you know, our Second Amendment talks about guns, but there's nothing that, this doesn't interfere with commerce. There's nowhere. So the, the federal government does not have that power because it's not in the Constitution and it's not implied. We. Oui. Yes. Correct. So yeah, so so the, the, the comment was that because the states because it has inequality, some states there are guns that are allowed close by the school. There are other states that they're not allowed close by the school. And because of that, you could have the inequality between the students who live in the states that allow the guns versus the students who don't. And so that goes into the argument. Now, in the US, we have nine Supreme Court justices. You have to have five out of the nine vote in favor of it. So this was a close decision. It was 5-4 which usually then the four justices write what we call a dissenting opinion, and later sometimes the, the, they can change it, but usually you have precedent. But in this one, they found that because there is the right of the, of the um, right to bear arms in the Constitution, but there's not necessarily this right, it interferes with it. You could think of, for example, maybe a student who lives in Alaska who has to co commute to school, you know, which might go over areas that you're going to inter encounter animals, that student might be able to have a weapon, whereas a student in New York might not. And so this is part of our federalism, the idea to think of what stuff might affect Utah or New York, but might be different in Texas. So reserved powers are the powers reserved to the state and the local government. Um, they they cannot interfere with these powers. So the 10th Amendment, our last of the Bill of Rights, 
says that any power not given to the federal government is automatically given to the states and local governments. Um, so most of what government does in the United States, most of the things we think about what government does is done by our states and our local governments. So for example, education. The, the Constitution does not talk about education. So it is our states and our local governments that handle education. There's, I know here in France, like it's the, the, the national government does high schools, the region does middle schools, and the local does elementaries, is that correct? Whereas there, it's all done by each local government and every state is sometimes completely different. So here's just kind of a little quick map, if you can see it, of the, the different kind of federal and state powers. So coin money, I'm trying to think anything, uh, established courts. Here's some of the, the power that's in between is levy and collect taxes, borrow money, make and enforce laws, establish courts, charter banks and corporation, take property for public purposes uh, with just compensation. And that's imminent domain. There's, you have to go through a long legal process, but both state and federal government can do that. So other powers that the state government have, regulate inter, intrastate government uh, commerce, so commerce that's only happening within your state. Also, uh, you can have a militia, so we have National Guard. And our National Guard is, so when I was in the Army, I actually joined as a National Guardman. So I was under Utah, it was the governor that was our commander in chief. We fell under the US Army, but we were over the state, under the state within the US Army. So for national disasters, when you see soldiers out there, we have laws that American soldiers, federal soldiers cannot be doing stuff within the states. So it's the National Guard that does stuff. So if there's a, a big tornado or a big accident and you see soldiers there, they're members of the National Guard. They're not gonna be members of the, the regular army. Um, so provide for public health, safety, welfare, and morals. Uh, and the states ratify constitutions. Although that one's kind of partially true because it first has to go through Congress and then it goes through the states. So uh, just real quick before we go on to the Bill of Rights, does anybody have any questions about kind of the, the separation of the powers and the federalism? Sorry, I'm gonna grab some water real quick. So yeah, the question is, is it a good, been a good theory to, to rely on the inter, intrastate commerce, interstate commerce? And yes, it is. Up until the 90s and the 2000s, so the last 25, 20 years, the Supreme Court has upheld every single time the government made a law according to that, every single time. So one thing that will affect you guys, if any of you go to the US in the near future, is what is the drinking age in the United States? 21, and does it say anything about the drinking age in the US Constitution? Doesn't say it at all. We, we ban drinking in the US Constitution and then unban drinking in the US Constitution, but there's nothing on, on drinking age. But what happened was, is the federal government said, they, could, they said, okay, we will give you money to repair your roads only if you make the drinking age 21. But if the drinking age is 18, you get no money. And so some states, I wanna say Montana and a few others held out for a long time. And then after a while they needed to repair their roads and they upped their age limit. So that is why every state in the US has, as far as I know, every state is the age of 21. Um, so they can usually do stuff like that. They, and with this, they said, you know, it affects interstate. And, not necessarily that the drinking affects interstate, but they can use money to encourage, and that has been found legal, is that they can come up with things that they suggest. So President Bush, the second President Bush, 
He had a program called No Child Left Behind, and it was kind of changing the education system. And the way they did it is they gave school money. Um, they gave schools money depending on depending on how much uh, how much they followed this law. So schools didn't have to; they could stay independent. They could ignore it, but then they lost the money. And the Supreme Court has found many times that that is constitutional. So. Okay, so when our laws were passed, when the Constitution was passed, there were a lot of people who wanted more things within the Constitution, and they wanted a Bill of Rights for citizens. So because of that, they, they wrote up the Bill of Rights around the same time that they wrote up the Constitution, but these were the rights they were passed shortly thereafter. So the Constitution, to be ratified, needed nine of the 13 states to vote on it, and a bunch of them only would vote on it as long as the Bill of Rights were also going to be considered. So they were written th there. Because there's, there's concern that the Constitution itself was, here's how you form a government. You know, remember 200-something years ago, nobody really knew what they were doing in forming a, 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 a democracy a republic. So they kind of came up with, here's the idea of how you do it. But within that, there was no, no information on rights of individuals. So because of it, they came up with the Bill of Rights. Now, does anybody know all 10 Bill of Rights? Okay, I don't know all 10 of Bill of Rights, so I'd be impressed if anybody did. But so we're going to go over kind of the, the 10. But there are some people, uh, to get into the Foreign Service, to become a, uh, an American diplomat, you have to take an exam. And there's always one or two questions about different Bill of Rights. So it's something I always tell people who want to become an American diplomat to study because there'll be questions about the amendments. Okay, so here are the first three, uh, the first three amendments in the U.S. Constitution. So does anybody know what the first amendment is? Yes. Right to what? What kinds of freedom? The freedom of speech, press, religion, assembly, and the right to petition. So it's the one that, that gives us our right to speech, right to, to assemble together. Um, our religious freedom is different than in France, which is, is interesting when you study kind of the difference, because both countries we think of, of having the freedom of religion, but in France it tends to be a secular government, and people can do whatever they want at home, and in the U.S., we're a secular government, but if people do it in public, that's fine too. So nobody would ever think about, you know, if I, well, okay, I represent the U.S. government, but if somebody who wasn't me was up here and they had a, a, a religious symbol, there'd be no problem in the U.S. So you all go to a Catholic university. It's probably a little more open here than it might be at a public university. And so that's one of the kind of religion, the, the kind of the difference with religion is that the government cannot make laws in acting on a specific religion. Um, what's the Second Amendment? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So it's our, our, it's our second one. It's the right to bear arms. The, it's probably our most controversial because you have a lot who, who say, it says in there it's for the militia. It says in there it's for our National Guard. Is that, you know, uh, our, our National Guard needs to be able to have, have arms. But there's others on the other side who say no, it's that each individual can have it. Now, if you remember with these first 10 amendments, this was not too long after uh, we won the, the, our independence from England. It's only been six years, seven, no, I'm trying to remember how many years it was. Anyway, it's only been a little while after it. So in everybody's mind, it's very still fresh of our fight with, with independence against England. And because of it, a lot of these amendments directly have to do with their experience during the battle. So one of the things the British would do is they would take away the, the weapons. And, and a complaint that a lot of Americans had is they lived on borderlands. They lived you know, not far from Native Americans who were hostile to them. And their weapons were taken away and they felt, they felt defenseless. So this is one of the, one of the, one of the amendments that's added to it. 
Do any of you know what the third one is? Because the third one is directly related to that. Let's see, anybody? Yes, in the back. What, sorry? I'm sorry, it's hard to hear from. The castle doctrine, yes. So it's basically that, that no soldier, no military person can come live in your house without your permission. So it's funny because this is probably the one that we talk about the least. Um, there's actually an American comedian that, that I saw recently joke around about the fact that they put this third. Like, so this was obviously such a big problem that this was the third thing they thought. Whereas nowadays you would never think about a soldier coming and demanding to live in your house. But during the independence war, that, was, that would happen a, quite a bit of different soldiers were being brought in and, and people were being kicked out of their house. So, um, so yeah, so it also, uh, along with the castle doctrine, it also is unre unreasonable searches and seizures. So this is a, a big one, is that you cannot go and search people's houses without proper cause, without a reason. This one's gone to the Supreme Court many times. There's, you know, the question of, obviously search and seizures of houses make sense, but then there's questions of people's cars, as cars became about, people's phones. Um, there's still questions today that go to the Supreme Court on search and seizure. Okay. Oh, and actually that's the, the bigger one. So the fourth one is search and seizure. Um, and it's the requirement for getting a, a warrant based on probable cause. So to search somebody's house, you have to go to a judge in the US and you have to have probable cause. If you watched American crime movies or American crime shows, you probably see this a lot. Um, what's the Fifth Amendment? Perfect, so the Fifth Amendment, the big one that you hear about the most is not to incriminate yourself. So oftentimes you'll see people, um, oh and I, the picture originally I had used is somebody who like zipped his mouth shut, um, but I, I think I switched it. But it's, you, you, you'll hear people say, I plead the fifth. So it's saying, I am exercising my constitutional right to not say anything, because if I say anything, there's a chance I can be charged with a crime. But it also sets out the rules for doing a grand jury. Um, eminent do domain, which we talked about before, which is where the federal government can take, or, and the local and state governments can take property. There's, there's definite requirements and regulations for that. So it's restricting em eminent domain. And, and then it also has double jeopardy. You guys know what double jeopardy is? JLo was in a movie called Double Jeopardy years ago. Um, and it was based on this, so if you wanna. So double jeopardy is you cannot be charged for the same crime twice. So in Jennifer Lopez's movie, this was probably like 20 years ago, she was convicted of killing her husband who actually faked his own death and hid, and so then she trained to go kill him. Um, and I don't know if, how that would really happen, but then she couldn't be convicted of killing him because she had already been convicted of killing him. So I don't know if that would be real, but if you ever want to see a Jennifer Lopez movie, I think it was not that great. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it was on Jebra, Double Jeopardy. One interesting thing about Double Jeopardy, though, is it restricts the, each level of government. So you can still be charged federally or for the state if it's a crime in both places. So even though you can't be charged multiple times for the same crime, you could be charged in multiple jurisdictions. So sometimes you'll see somebody charged in the federal level, and usually because of costs and other stuff, they will only let, they will only have one group do it. Most of the time too, if a criminal does some crime, you know, let's say they kidnap somebody, and they brought them across state lines, that becomes a federal crime. They'll usually let the federal government charge them, and if somehow it doesn't go the way the federal government wants, then the state government will charge them. But then if that doesn't go how they want, then that's the end of it, because it's, it's illegal to charge somebody with, do, or to do double jeopardy. Um, so the Sixth Amendment is the right to a fair and speedy trial. So you can't just leave somebody in jail for however long. So when I was in law school, I worked in 
in Cambodia for a summer for a, a human rights group. And in Cambodia, if you, you know, read about the history of the Khmer Rouge, they killed most of the lawyers during the time of the Khmer Rouge. And so they're building up their legal, their legal profession right now. And the organization I worked with basically was trying to get judges or get lawyers out to the different districts further out of the city of Phnom Penh to help represent these young people. So one of the first clients I met was a young 16 year old kid who'd been in jail for almost a year, accused of murder, and he didn't know who he was accused of murder, he didn't know when he was accused of murder, he didn't know anything. He was just sitting in jail. So in Cambodia they're re redoing that, but that's one of the things that in the US Constitution we felt like somebody cannot sit in jail for a long time just because they've been accused of a crime before. So the Seventh Amendment is a trial by jury, but it also includes in civil cases. So I know in France, you guys have administrative judges, you guys have uh, civil judges, and you guys have criminal judges. And in the US, they're kind of all done at the same place, although the, the, the way you prosecute it is different. Sometimes they're different, like family courts or other stuff. But it, even, in, even in, um, in civil cases, certain civil cases, you can, have, you can request a jury to try the civil case. So does anybody know what the Eighth, uh, eighth Amendment is? This one you'll hear about every now and then as well. Um, so the Eighth one is against cruel and unusual punishment. So you can't punish somebody and do it. So one, of, one, of, one case that you would see in the past is people who are put in solitary confinement so you guys go to school in a jail, um, an American style jail, uh, and they were, th they were put into a place by themselves for a long amount of time as a way to punish them. And people found there was a lot of psychological damage and other stuff by it. So they sued saying this is cruel and unusual. So in the constitution, you cannot do that. You cannot do things that are cruel and unusual. So sometimes this is tested because some people say, well, it's not necessarily cruel to do this, or other people, there's a, um, a, what, a warden of a jail in Arizona, and he's no longer the warden, but he was, but he would make all the inmates wear pink underwear, and he would make them all sleep in a tent in Arizona. And so he was sued multiple times for cruel and unusual. In the end, the Supreme Court said, you know, you, Wearing pink underwear is not cruel and unusual. And in the tents, as long as you know, they have water and other stuff is not cruel and unusual. But this is a, another case that will come up. The Ninth Amendment is, that, is the one that kind of gives the federalism everything, is it's that any power that is not listed in the Constitution is given to the people. So it's that the people have the rights and have the power that are not in the Constitution. So this is where state rights come about and where local government rights, but then individual also have, have these rights. And then the 10th one is the one we talked about before, is that any law not put into the Constitution for the federal government is reserved by each state government. So each of the states kind of have the right to, to do whatever laws they want to do. So, Sometimes with federalism, it's great because you have great differences between states and the, the, the needs and the problems in New York are extremely different than Montana. But other times it's hard because sometimes you'll have inequality between Montana and New York where maybe there shouldn't be inequality. So one area that, that the Supreme Court gets involved with is whenever the states sue each other or if there are cases on federal law where the courts are finding different outcomes. So if they're saying it's cruel and unusual in Texas, but a, 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 state, a federal court says it's not cruel and unusual in Nevada, then the Supreme Court will, will decide, 
you know, if, if it is cruel and unusual for the whole federal government. So that's kind of an overview of where in the US we get our powers, where each of the government gets it, and then the, the 10 amendments, the first Bill of Rights, and, and the powers that, that the federal government has and the powers that each of the citizens have. Um, and with that, With that, I'll ask just if, the, if you guys have any questions. What questions do you have for me? Yeah. The differences, so, so the question's about the differences between the National Supreme Court and the State Supreme Court. And the links, yes. So that's a good question. So first off, every state can, can form their own Supreme Court and it's up to them on how to do it. So for the longest time, so in the US, it's usually the district court, the court of appeals, and then the Supreme Court. Whereas in, in New York, for some reason, the, the highest court was the court of appeals. I don't know why they called it different. But every state can do state laws and, and people can sue within that or go to crime within that. You go through those three levels. If you at the end of, of a crime or you know a state crime, you then can go to the federal government, to the Supreme Court, and especially if it's an issue that falls under that. So the, one of the big differences is obviously the Supreme Court handles, and the, the US courts handle federal law, whereas the others will handle local and state law. The Supreme Court will handle anything between a state and a foreign government. So if, you know, uh, if Lyon or you know, France sued against Pennsylvania for not doing a contract, it, that would automatically go to the Supreme Court because it's the federal or it's the state going to the to the uh, foreign government and states against state. So recently, in the last election, the state of Texas thought that Pennsylvania wasn't doing their elections right. So the state of Pennsylvania or Texas sued Pennsylvania and it went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court dismissed it saying, Texas, you have nothing to do with Pennsylvania's election laws. And so it was automatically dismissed. But that's a case where a state tried to say that another state wasn't sued another state. Another question, maybe? Otherwise, I have one, Mr. Consul. Um, can you please tell us more about the way uh, the power is divided and how it does in impact or affect uh, the, the, the handling of the COVID-19 crisis about the mask and so on? So that's a very good question. So COVID-19 has been an, ex uh, an excellent example of, of the division between the federal government and the state's government. So for one, the federal government is in charge of who comes in and out of the U.S. So if you remember, it started with President Trump, it's still continuing right now under President Biden, but there's a ban on a lot of countries coming into the US. So that is controlled by the federal government. So I'll be honest, a lot of my time, I email a lot of French citizens who wanna to go to the US right now and it's closed. And that's the, the federal government that decides that. But within each state, like masks mandates, there are some states that have made it illegal for schools to require masks. So in Florida right now, it is illegal for a school to tell you you have to wear a mask. Okay, other states like California, the state has made it required that every student wear a mask. So this is a, a, a big difference, obviously, between Florida and California on, on the two sides. The, most states are somewhere in the middle. Most states allow each school district to decide. So one big thing that I loved being here in France is, you know, I've got kids here, and I love that the French education system, not the universities, unfortunately, but the education system last year was in person, that my kids went to school the entire time. Whereas in, in the US, every state and every school district, which sometimes is a city, sometimes is a few cities, was different. So one place, you'd have the students who were online studying you know, with teachers virtually, and then two towns over or the state over, you'd have people being there in person. 
So there's kind of very big differences between the states. It's interesting, President Biden recently said that every federal employee has to be vaccinated, I think by November or something. And also any company over 500 employees has to be vaccinated. Each employee has to be vaccinated. So this for sure for me will go to, there'll be court cases where people say this interferes with state rights. The federal government cannot tell individuals. So th in my opinion, they're gonna, the, the federal government's gonna be sued because they're, individual, they're interfering with state rights and they're gonna be sued because people will say they're interfering with individual rights. Now, I don't know how the Supreme Court will find on it. The, I, I don't know. Uh, I took a health law class a long time ago, <laughs> but I, I don't know the rules on it. But these are stuff that the states are saying right now and definitely will move on. So COVID is a, a great example of, of you, you go home, like my home state tends to be more um, open, more liberal, uh, liberal in a international sense, not in a US political sense. So, <laughs> so they tend to be more like with, with COVID, you saw a lot less masks and a lot less uh, restrictions than you did in, in California, for example. So I went home for Christmas time and most of the movie theaters and other stuff were open. Whereas in California, they're barely opening right now. In New York, you, I think Broadway is opening this week, I wanna say. And so, so everything's a little different depending on the state. Yeah, thank you very much. Would you have some? Yes. Yeah, oh. please. You, you, you can even use the micro so that your classmate can hear. <laughs> So at, at the beginning, you said the Constitution was the means to unite all the states. Do you think now the Constitution has still this mission because we have really different states like Nevada or New York with different activity, different kind of people? So do you think this, the Constitution has still this mission? And if not, what is the means used by the government for unite the, the states? Good question. So the question is, is does the Constitution unite the states like it did then? And I think it does. So when I was a soldier, when as a diplomat, I swear, I, I, I do a, a, I guess it's swearing in. Yeah, we call it a swearing in ceremony where you promise. And for, for us, it's to the Constitution. So I swear in to the Constitution of the United States. I don't swear to the government. I don't swear to the president, I don't swear to Congress, I don't swear to the people, I swear to the Constitution. And we swear to uphold the, the rights of the Constitution. So I think, you know, it's interesting, I have a lot of conversations with people about, kind of here in France, there's the idea of being French, and part of that is speaking French, and part of it is, is the secularism, and, and, you know, in France, not talking about race, or not talking about other issues, this is what it is to be French. In the US, to be American is believing in the Constitution. And, and there are some Americans who say, no, 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 it also should be English or should be other stuff. And there's others who think it should be multiculturalism or overall, but pretty much everybody agrees it's, it's the US Constitution. And so, so I do think it is something that does unite us more so than divide us. Now there, like I said, some people don't like our Second Amendment and other people don't like other parts, but, but overall, <laughs> yes, there is. Yes, so I had a question concerning uh, the new government's position on reintegrating uh, international organi organizations such as UNESCO. So. The, no, that's a good, a good question. So the question is about the US, the new government choosing to do it. So it's within the, the president's power so within the Constitution, within the federal government, there are parts, you know, different sections, uh, articles within the Constitution that breaks up the power between the executive, the president, the legislature, Congress, and the judiciary, the courts. So within the president's power is, is foreign policy. So President Trump left UNESCO, um, but do you guys remember why he left UNESCO? Exactly, so UNESCO um, recognized Palestine, and so it was one of the, one of the 
one of the things that, that the big UN has not done. And so as the legitimate government of the Palestinians, so President Trump left UNESCO. President Biden is exploring joining UNESCO again. Um, I don't know the official policy, so I don't want to speak and get ahead. But I do know that it is something we're talking about right now. But it's, it's up to the president. So I mean, President Biden, right on the first day he was in office, rejoined the Paris Climate Accords. Um, and there's other international organizations that, that, that we could join or, or leave. UNESCO is obviously the big one that, and it affects us here in France because the headquarters are in Paris. Um, so personally, I, I think President Biden's looking at it. I just think he has a lot of other things he's focusing on. Yes. Uh, Another question? Yes. Yeah, please. Okay. Yes, please. Now you all have to wash your hands afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yes, first of all, thank you for your very interesting presentation. Um, I have a more career-related uh, question, if I may ask. Yeah. Um, concerning your time in the military and army, actually. How did you find working with a legal background in the military environment, if you may put it that so way? So I actually was, I was in the military before, well, and there's two answers. My big part of the military was before I went to law school. Um, and so I was, I had graduated undergraduate and then got deployed to Afghanistan or to Iraq. Uh, afterwards, I worked for the, the military legal in the Air Force. And it was super fascinating because it's, it's a form of federal law that is very much independent of normal federal law. So the, the military has its own, in the US we call it the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And if you ever watch the TV show JAG, um, that's what, they're judge advocate generals, that's a US lawyer, so I worked with the JAGs in the Air Force. Now the real ones don't fly jets and do all the cool stuff that they do in the TV show. But, but it was interesting because it's a, it's a type of law that is federal, but it is very much kind of independent from all other laws. So all of the, the cases, all of the, the courts, everything is done within the military. And it was, a, it, was a, it was fascinating kind of see the difference of it. If I practiced law, I think I might have stayed in military law, but I liked doing diplomacy more. And so that's why I decided to kind of go this way. Yeah. Does that answer your question or? Okay. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? Maybe a last question. Do not be shy. Yeah, this is. And do not forget to use hydroalcoholic gel afterwards. <laughs> uh, last year was a year of election, and we talked a lot about uh, the uh, electoral system and the way to change it, maybe. So do you think amending the United States Constitution is easier said than done? It's definitely easier said than done. Um, personally, I do not think we're gonna change the Electoral College in the near future. Right now, there are politically wise winners and losers. And so those who would lose because of it will do stuff to make sure it doesn't change. So the Electoral College is that every state, you get the votes to that state, and then the president has to win a certain amount of states. The, the benefits of it is that instead of in, instead of focusing on just the big cities, you know, the presidents in, the, in other places sometimes will focus just, and I'll use the US as an example, but like just New York and Los Angeles and Houston and, and Chicago, because you can change the votes between those places. You can make a big difference. You know, if you change the amount of votes in California, it's gonna be a bigger difference than if you go to a place like Iowa or a place like Indiana or some of the smaller states. So one of the benefits are it focuses the presidents when they're running to focus on people who don't just live in the big cities, who don't just live in the capitals. And so every time we have what we call the swing states, which are our states that will change, and those change every time. So Virginia, where, which is where I vote because I went to law school in Virginia, I, li I live there, we have a home there. Um, Virginia was a swing state during President Obama's time Whereas now it's, it's gone more to the Democrats the last few years and other states are changing. Michigan now is more of a swing state, whereas it wasn't as much. 
And so those are some of the benefits. Obviously, the negative is it's not always it, the person who gets the most votes wins. So sometimes if you're in California, I'm going to predict right now the 2024 election, the Democrats going to win California. Doesn't matter who it is. Doesn't matter who they're running against. They're going to win California. The Republican will probably win Texas. It doesn't matter who it is, who it's against. You know, and so that's one of the hard things is because if you're a Democrat living in Texas, Austin, Texas is a very liberal left leaning city. It's the capital of Texas, but the rest of the state's very right. But the state of Texas is going to go to the Republican. Ultimately, though, I don't think it's going to change because you need to have, and I forget, so, but I think it's like two thirds of the Senate and Congress need to agree on a, an amendment. And then it goes to the states, and then I think it's two thirds of the states have to agree. And the chances of that happening to change the, the Electoral College, it, it won't happen until the Republicans start losing because of it. Because then if both sides win and lose because of the Electoral College, then people might say, okay, this isn't fair. But right now, where there's a clear winner and a loser, it won't change. So. so. Thank you very much again, in, indeed. Thank you. I think it was the la last question. <laughs> uh, th there could have been more, actually, but uh, it could be for uh, next time. By the way, w one of our colleagues here uh, works to a certain extent on the electoral uh, colleges and so on. So, so may maybe for a, a future uh, a future conference or or a meeting between between us. Uh, Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Cancel. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It's been great talking to you. Uh, I think that uh, you will, uh, well, sooner or li later, go back uh, to to the USA and uh, to Washington. So yeah. at least we we had uh, again <laughs> this pleasure to uh, to have you here tonight. Thank you to all of you for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, uh, have a lovely evening and. Uh, keep on having a good start of the academic year. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. And just real quick, if you have any other questions, you can email usaleon at state.gov. Uh, it's our team that, that does it even after I leave. It's their email. And then you can follow us on Instagram and on Facebook and see the different things. We talk about different programs, different states, different things like that. So anyway. Thank you again. Thank you, guys.